So good evening, folks. It seems hardly two seconds since Burma week ended and it's Great Escape Week now. But this is what we're talking about this week. It is 77 years ago this week that the final preparations were being made to break uh, out of Stalag Luft 3 in, uh, in Poland. And we have got a lineup of shows for you to look at that history from various different angles, uh, different nationalities, different takes on it, the big view, the overview, the small view. But to start things off, I have absolutely... The, one of the premier Great Escape historians. Jonathan Vance has been studying it for about 40 years now, which is um, quite a long time. He is the author of various books. He's a professor of history. I have the early version of his book when it was called uh, A Gallant Company. There's a, yep. a newer version now, and at various points we'll mention it. You can see in the description on YouTube how to get that and where to buy it, and I recommend it as an incredibly good starting point to understand the escape. Um, anyway, welcome to the show, Jonathan. You had a busy afternoon of uh, teaching. Thanks very much for having me. Yes, the teaching never stops to the end of term coming up, so uh, uh, everything's getting super busy now, but glad to take time out to chat with you. Great. So the thing about The Great Escape is there's so much information out there in the popular memory because of the movie and the remake movie and websites and newspapers tackle and every time the anniversary comes around out come uh the, the exhibitions again and there was one in london a couple of years ago dan snow was there and they had the motorbike steve mcqueen news from the film and they talked about it and they showed the film they talked about the real escape so it, it never leaves the public consciousness but when you started i guess like myself it was probably the film that when you're a kid that start kind of starts things off for you and then you you being in canada as well established with Ted Barris, a lot of the escapers work in Adian and Commonwealth. But you know, what was the first kind of entry for you into into studying this, uh, this these events? It was it was the film, and I remember it very clearly. The first time I saw it, it was uh, uh, Victoria Day in Canada, the May twenty fourth weekend, and Victoria Day in Canada is always marked by a big fireworks exhibition, um, and we lived near the park. So we would always go over when the fireworks started. And, and it so happened that the great escape was showing on that very night. It would have been a Monday night. And, um, I was said, okay, I'll, I'll come watch the fireworks. I just want to watch the first bit of this movie first. And then the music started up and then I got into the characters and right from the first five minutes, I was hooked. Uh, I never saw the fireworks that year. Um, uh, it had such a massive impression. I mean, I was, I was maybe 10 or 11. Uh, and since I was a, I was a strange child, I, I didn't just, uh, kind of read about it and rewatch the movie. I started to, tr to get in touch with, with, um, uh, former prisoners then. So I think I was 13 when I went to my first POW reunion. Um, I guess I was a budding historian to begin with. And, and since then it's, uh, it's, it's kind of never left me. It, it gets its hooks into you. It never, never leaves you. And given that, you know, as you said there, you have met a lot of the, the men who escaped and the men who were involved in the preparations and their family members, does that mean to some extent you're not as objective as you should be because you've got to know these people and understand their motivations? Uh, that's probably a fair question. I mean, I, I, I've always regarded this story f uh, protectively, I guess. Um, historians tend to be a little, a little territorial about our work anyways. Um, but I've always, uh, yeah, I, I, since I started doing this, this research in depth, I've always felt to, to some degree that I owe it to the people who I've worked with, uh, to make sure the story got told properly. Uh, and oftentimes it doesn't, I mean, you met, mentioned the remake of the, the great escape, uh, the great escape to the untold story, uh, which of course was untold because it was entirely false. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's right. I think I'm I'm probably not as objective as I as I might be, but if it's any comfort to uh, everybody out there, I, I do it from a good place. <laughs> and that's the you know, point I just said to, to to Jonathan before he went live by having seven shows over the course of the week. You know, Guy Walters, whose whose book is fairly recent, and he's watching now. But hello, Guy. You know, he went into the the, the British archive kind of sense of things and looking for the documentation. And you've come at it from a knowing all the veterans and meeting them all. And then there's Louise, who's, whose uncle was involved in escape and was, you know, was murdered by it. So everyone's coming at it from a slightly different point of view. And I suppose history is owned by everybody. And, and uh, I did a historiography show a couple of weeks ago, and John Buckley said, yeah, there is no such thing as truth. It's only interpretation anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. with all of these events, it's how you see it, how you filter it through your, through your own um, 
biases and your own interests. And But the fact is, here we are 77 years on, still talking about it. It still fascinates people around the world. But um, let's start with the, the purposes for the camps. So Stella Agla 3 is part of a whole set, set up of camps throughout you know occupied Europe, mm-hmm. Poland and Germany. There were the Air Force camps and the Army camps and Naval camps. But it ha- immediately it has the reputation as being the bad boys camp. Is that completely true? True. Um, it's not entirely fair. I mean, it was, it was created uh, first and foremost to centralize air force prisoners, not necessarily air force bad boys, but air force prisoners generally, because the Luftwaffe had, had started off the war by popping them in, in four or five different camps around, around Germany. And that was not terribly successful. Uh, and, and given the fact that by 1941, early 1942, you started to get large numbers of Air Force prisoners uh, coming into Germany, um, it's simply not sustainable to to pop them here and there where you can find them. So uh, originally, East Compound of Luft Three and then North Compound, they were created really as a way to bring them all together. Uh, and the fact that a lot of the uh, troublemakers happened to be in those those first couple of lots. Uh, was was largely coincidental. I mean, it's not a it's not a cold. It's uh, it's mm. not a place where they where they put all the known malefactors. It just so happens that, that you put enough airmen together, and you you get a bunch of malefactors uh, coming out of the woodwork. Is more is a better way of putting it, probably. Yeah, because one of the things that came out we did a show with um, about Group Captain Massey early early in the year, and and having to balance as senior British officer. The, the 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 contrasting reactions to being a prisoner within mm. the camp because he has to um, be responsible for all of their um, their the men and some were keen avid escapers and some were not keen avid escapers and to me that's one of the things that fascinates me as I'm getting old and I've read a lot about the Great Escape it's we don't tend to hear the voices of the mm-hmm. people who were just in the camp who were either ambivalent about escaping or in, that, in some cases actually against escape. We've heard the voices of the escapers, and obviously mm-hmm. that's what people want to hear about. But when you were meeting veterans, did did you speak to some of the guys who you know were, were, were less enthused about the whole escaping uh, principle? Oh, I did. I spoke to a lot of guys. I mean, there, there's so you've got a camp with, with at various times, 10,000 people in it. Uh, you've got an escape organization that's a small majority of that that population. Most people in there are are neither involved or interested in escaping. And people like someone like Massey recognizes that probably the most significant uh, challenge to the the welfare of POWs is is their mental health, uh, their guilt, their feelings of inadequacy, their their feelings of of uselessness. And so giving them other things to, to do, other positive ways to spend their time was critical, whether it be sports or education or theater or whatever. And I remember talking to one fellow who had been a leading light in the, in the theater. And uh, he was diplomatic after probably it would have been 40 years then. But, but he said he was always terrified that somebody from X organization was going to descend on his theater. Uh, and start demanding things for the escape uh, when there were things that they had had secured legitimately through the Red Cross or other organizations that were um, should have been sort of off limits for for escape. So, yeah, I mean, we we have a picture of um, an organization in which everyone uh, uh, agrees with Roger Bushel and is one hundred percent behind it. That's not really what it would have been like in the camp. Um, and I mean, you also talked to, I've talked to, to, to all sorts of fellows who had no idea what was going on. Uh, yeah. it, it, they, they knew little and cared less. So it's a, it's a much more complicated story than we imagine, I think. And it's, frankly, is that, that's com- that complication is exactly what I want you to talk about tonight. Because with popular history like this, even you know people who've r- widely read, we're all running through the Great Escape theme in our heads. We're all thinking about Steve McQueen and Angus Lee and all those those guys and movies. And and the fact is, it was hundreds of people involved in it. A, a very very complicated, complex organization that's existing, as you said, within a within a camp where there were all these other things things going on. The people are putting on the plays. Let's not forget the educational aspect that was going on. The you know the huge number of POWs who got educations. Uh, mm-hmm. while they were in captivity all that's going on as well and as you say the whole morale thing and i think 
just add, I didn't tell you before we li went live, Jonathan, but I did a tweet earlier about a, a poll, basically, asking people what they thought of, was the escape, you know, a, a tragedy? Was it a, a, a useful a morale booster for the POWs? Was it a gallant kind of, a, 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 you know, up yours at the Germans? Mm -hmm. And the vote is is equally between the three. People saying it okay. was a waste <laughs> of time. People say so, and that's I suppose is exactly what Massey and the other senior officers are having to balance that that keeping everybody happy in an organization like that when there's nothing actually to do because that's mm -hmm. the thing about military. If if you're not if you haven't anything to do, the military, the army, the air force will find you something to do. Hence, blankoing your equipment and polishing yeah. your buttons. And in an I environment mean, when you're in a camp and you've got lots and lots of spare time, keeping keeping people's mental health um, up is 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 very very <laughs> important. So we can understand all these different yeah. things that has, go, has going on, but the complications of of, of the escape. So. The, the camp gets built for the predominantly for Air Force prisoners, and then initially mm. they're Americans as well. And there's just Poles and Czechs and Dutch and all sorts of nationalities there. Um, and then the ex organization begins, which had been started at other camps because there are these prisoners have been moved around a bit. Um, how 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 important was was Roger Bushnell to that? I mean, we know of him as Big X, but his personality clearly is one of the big big driving factors, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, there there was no question he uh, rose to the heights, if you like, on the force of his personality. Um, he was an ex extremely uh, self confident. Some might say, well, some would say, arrogant individual who who uh, believed without question that his way was the right way. Um, he was. Uh, by far from the highest ranking officer in the camp. He had, he certainly didn't have the highest seniority. Uh, there were um, all probably dozens, 20, 30, 40 people who outranked him uh, in, in various ways, but the force of his personality uh, was sufficient to um, garner him the sort of unquestioned control of the escape organization. And then at that point, it's left to someone like Massey or or Wing Commander Day to try to balance um, what Bushel wants with with what the rest of the camp needs. Uh, hmm. And sometimes what Bushel wants is not good for the rest of the camp, and so difficult decisions have to be made. And then there were certainly instances in which Roger Bushel was not happy about decisions that were made about uh, uh, things that he had requested. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, he's a fascinating guy, and and like most people who were exceptionally skilled, exceptionally able, exceptionally charismatic, um, thought a lot of himself. Uh, he generated strong opinions one way or the other. Some people, even when I talked to them in 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 the ninety eighties and nineties, um, loyal to Bushel unto the death, uh, still. But others, a uh, bit of a troublemaker. Uh, maybe caused more issues than than was good for the camp as a whole. So I mean, you you create those strong opinions that last for for five decades afterwards. That's a forceful personality, mm. and that's one of those things that, of course, for those watching, we all know that the terrible outcome of of fifty uh, escapers being murdered by the Gestapo, including including Roger. Um, and, and that means to some extent they've been immortalized because they were murdered. And, and it means that when you're people like yourself and Guy Walters and other researchers are, are interviewing these the surviving prisoners, that they don't necessarily want to say anything negative about people who ended up being murdered by the Gestapo. Their, their, their object, objectivity is, is possibly being influenced by the fact they're talking about someone who was treated with with absolute savagery by the by the third reich so that that presents another layer of intrigue mm -hmm. is that you know had had roger roger for example survived like montgomery did montgomery could be judged by how arrogant he was after the war to some extent and therefore you're not you're not knocking anybody who died tragically yeah. you're knocking someone who's going out and speaking publicly and, and, and that that adds a factor to it but the complications of organizing the, the escape so ro roger you know roger bushel incredibly forceful personality mm -hmm. incredibly dynamic and 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 um he, he assembles his staff of, of experts. But the thing is, it's way more people involved in the camp than certainly not that we're going to be talking about the movie all night, but it, it's mm -hmm. the movie. It's like a dozen people involved and it's incredibly complex. Um, so, so give us a little bit of a background about how, 
how that organization was was set up and how it was managed. Mm-hmm. So, so Bushel turns out was a, a master of uh, what we call now project management, uh, I guess, in, in business speak. Um, he had a lot of great gifts as a, as a leader. And one of them was that he was, was uh, really good at picking the right people for the job. Uh, and then generally leaving them to to do that job as they saw fit. So he was big X, uh, and then there were there were um, chiefs under him for all of the different parts of uh, of the escape organization, from from tunneling to compasses to maps to construction uh, to security. And um, typically, Bushel once he appointed those people, he would get regular progress reports on how they were going but he, he tried not to meddle in their uh how they ran their operation and we're talking about operations um say the map making operation would have been maybe six people uh, at any given time on the one end of the scale and then for security uh or or the dispersal of tunnel sand uh the penguins you're looking at hundreds of, of people and um, I mean, just the logistics of organizing, let's well, just take security, uh, organizing lookouts around the entire compound so that at any given time, they know where every single guard is in the camp. Because if they lose track of somebody, uh, that could bring down weeks, months of work. Um, and so this, I mean, it must have been a, uh, in, in the pre-computer age when you can't do spreadsheets. Um, a remarkable job to put together probably 300, 400 security people on rotating shifts so that they're, they are constantly on the lookout and know what's going on in every part of the compound at every moment. That's, I mean, in terms of project management, that's a, that's a remarkable achievement. And pretty much all having to be done verbally because it's not like you exactly. have to put, you know, charts up on them. You're in charge of tunnel digging you this week, Fred. I mean, it has to be done with communication and, ver- uh, and, and just memory. So, I was reading yeah, it's in all... prep for this week. Um, I was reading an article somewhere that suggested that um, Bushel was either Asperger's or autistic or something like that. You know, I don't want to necessarily go down mm-hmm. that path, but clearly he's got a particular way of working and a particular way of functioning, very, very obsessive. And I'm using that as a both, with both positive and possibly negative connotations as well, mm-hmm. but but highly driven. And, you know, it's, it's an odd question, but do you think the whole um, what happened within that camp could have happened without Roger? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think um, his experience as an escaper since the the fall of 1940 gave him uh, a cachet amongst even the the, the experienced escapers in the camp. And I think that combined with his his, uh, incredible personality and his experience uh, in in occupied Europe on his his, uh, second last escape, he was regarded as sort of the the man, the resource. Uh, he had the ideas, he had the plans. I, I can't see anyone else coming along and saying, "Look, we're going to shut down all private escape attempts and we're going to focus on my scheme." Um, mm-hmm. But I think because it's bushel, uh, people buy into that. And when when small individual escapes are allowed, it's on his terms. It's not on anyone else's terms. So for him to be to to achieve that level of control. Uh, in a prison camp the size of North Compound, uh, I think is is remarkable. I, I frankly I can't see anyone else be, being able to achieve that in that context. Wow. Even someone who who outranks Bushel or has more experience in the Air Force, of which there are many in the camp. But you know he has his key um, lieutenants using the using an army phrase. But you know, in terms of, of leadership, so who are some of the um, the unsung heroes, perhaps in just the organisation? I don't mean necessarily the the people who made the tunnel traps, but the organisation side of it, the the the, the, the planners, really. Mm-hmm. So I mean, the, the security is is in, at the outset in charge of uh, the American uh, fellow Junior Clark, and and putting that organisation together. Uh, just in terms of the, uh, as we said earlier, in terms of organizing the manpower would have been uh, remarkable. Um, the so he he uses the heads of the big uh, parts of his of X organization as his sort of uh, supreme war council, I guess you'd call it. So he's always got Junior Clark in there. Later, George Harsh, uh, the the American in the 
uh, Canadian Air Force. He's always got Wally Flutty in there, his tunnel guy. He's 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 always got um, a few of these individuals who he knows and trusts uh, and um, wants to have uh, around with the with the uh, decision making when it's necessary. But by the same token, it's very clear that decisions are his. Um, mm. If there is uh, something that needs to be dealt with in one of the organizations, he'll he'll take a recommendation. He'll take some advice, but the decision's his. Um, and I mean, I guess that's why you why you put people in command because some the buck has to stop somewhere. Um, mm. And he made no bones about the fact that it was stopping with with him, even though yes, he had tremendously able lieutenants surrounding him to uh, uh, help him with with various elements. But with the with the plan, I mean, again, we my audience is normally a pretty good. I mean, people like Guy Walters who writ, has written books oh, yeah. himself on Great Escape Watching. So we people know they know the basics. They know the basis of there being a forgery department and a construction department and the penguins and the security system and things like that. But you know, we talked before going online about the, just the amount of media the attention there is on the, the Great Escape every mm -hmm. time, every year, this time of year. What are the enduring? Uh, myths and legends that annoy you that get repeated about the planning side of things, particularly that you go, Oh no, not that, not that old chestnut again. Um, Oh boy. <laughs> it's tricky because so much about the movie has, has dominated the, the kind of vocabulary about, about the escape. And I, I mean, because it was my starting point, I really liked the movie. Uh, I mean, it's, and I think what Sturgis did uh, with Brick Hill's original book was was pretty sharp in that you can't have a, a big movie with a, a cast of 500 major players. So by combining individual characters, maybe two, maybe three people into one person, um, you get uh, a kind of broad coverage of, of ex-organization expertise while only having to meet five or six different, uh, different characters. Um, I, I never like the the. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which um, American culture has tried to take over parts of the Second World War um, unjustly, but in fact, there were enough Americans in Luft Three for the for the bulk of 1943 uh, who played key roles in um, the escape organization that to sideline them just because they weren't around when the escape itself went out is is i think desperately unfair um and and one of the decisions that bushel made which in hindsight was was probably controversial was to speed up on tom so that it could go before the americans got moved out i think he recognized that this was not a, a royal air forces only operation uh this was an allied air forces operation there were lots of americans who who had put huge amounts of work into it um and who he wanted to see get the benefit of of that effort, maybe speeding things up was was behind the ultimate demise of 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 Tom. Um, who knows? And there are also well, that, the I would just leap in there because to me that is one of the pivotal mo well the pivotal moment in in the pre escape mm -hmm. um, phase because there's in all the prep. And the reading I've done, there's kind of two ways you can look at that decision by Roger there. Because on the one hand, because what happens is, for those who don't, who, who aren't aware, the, that many more American um, U.S. Army Air Force guys are being shot down because we're at that stage of the war because they're the daylight bombing, what have you. So the Germans decide to build a new compound and, and shove all the Americans into a new compound. And this is happening right at the time when they're forging ahead on on free tunnel. Okay, let's 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 get back to basics there. There's yeah. Tom, Dick, and Harry mass escape blah 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 and then the americans are being moved to another camp now some people that talk about that explain it as a, as you have just done about it roger being um wanting these americans who've been integral to the building of the tunnel the planning of the tunnel the digging of the tunnel to be part of the escape other views say that the the, the because he as you said there um they work faster and then mm. they maybe cut some corners security isn't quite as tight as it had been and tom gets discovered and calamity calamity but the other way of looking at it is that it was it was bushel's drive his almost personal obsession that got the forced things to go quicker 
um, rather than a sympathetic view towards the Americans. And that's it's the same. I mean, we can't go back in time and yeah. ask Roger Bush or what he what he what his decision was based on. But mm. it does. It, it fascinates me that, that a decision that has can be interpreted two ways. Um, it, it's. So, I mean, I, I, I can see the um, the position that Bush would have found himself in. Uh, I mean, the, the initial decision to uh, with the three tunnels, then then we turn Dick into a storage tunnel, and then we sort of mothball Harry for bit and focus on on Tom. Um, I mean, if you look at the timing and the realities. Uh, Bushel is in a, a difficult position. It's difficult to um, escape in the dead of winter. Nobody wants to, to break the tunnel in November. Um, it's also difficult to keep a trap secure for months and months and months. Um, because, and this is the, the problem with the trap of Harry and, and why some have argued that that was, was accelerated uh, unnecessarily because it was, it was, um, becoming more and more difficult to camouflage as the, as the materials uh, expanded and shrank uh, with the uh, passage of time. So I, I think Bushel's inclination to speed things up was, was a good one because uh, the longer a tunnel survives, the more likely it's going to be found. Uh, that seems to me to be a, a, a kind of basic understanding. And so for him to to uh, decide that um, sort of it'll be full speed ahead on uh, uh, on Tom and damn the consequences, even if it was a, a rash decision, I can see why he made it. Uh, and it may be that the talking about the Americans was for for public consumption um, uh, for political reasons uh, to camouflage the fact that that he wanted to see it accelerated and, and go quickly for other reasons. But I still think it was the, it was the right call given what was likely to happen over the, over the, the ensuing weeks and months had Tom not been discovered then. Mm. Yeah. I mean, fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm loving your response to see it. Now the, other, the next thing I want to get to is the plan was to break a considerable number of men mm -hmm. out of the tunnel. 250 is the figure usually quoted, but the thing that is intriguing um, is that they those escapers would not be offered, if you like, the same level of chance of escape yeah. because there weren't the resources available. Um, and let, forget the idea, folks, of James Garner escaping in a grey <laughs> lounge suit that he must have picked up <laughs> off the peg. I mean, their, their civilian clothing was, you know, it would pass in half light. You know, they, they weren't going out in yeah. lovely suits. And the thing is, with what they're achieving in the camp, and it's incredible, isn't it? You have 4,000 4, bed boards and how many bunk beds taken apart and all the light bulbs and the wiring and the mm -hmm. tins, everything else. But to get 250 men out, there's going to be leagues of chances to get out. Now, yeah. with, it, with, with all your study over the years, going from being you know, a young kid watching a film to someone you know older now, that decision that you know you might you might get out, but you're a hard ass. So you're gonna be you're gonna have a, yeah. a block of chocolate in your pocket, and you've got you know your your battle dress blouse has been kind of dyed brown with some boot dark brown with some boot polish, and that's about all you've got. And you've got a compass made that by, by Al Haight, but mm -hmm. basically you're on your own. And the other end, the top end, you've got people who have got maps and house devices and passes and things. And they've got the train type tables and they've got mm -hmm. money. That that inequality of what the, the face what, the men who went into that they were completely aware of that inequality, weren't they? Oh, without question. I mean, every everybody knew that the exit order from the tunnel was was carefully jigged so that the people who were going out first, the first thirty or so people, were the ones who had legitimate chances of success. Uh, these were the people who had the language skills, they had the best papers, they had the best clothing, they had the best equipment, they had the best plan. <laughs> Those were the ones from whom the successful escapers were going to come. And no one quibbled with that. Uh, I mean, someone who, like van der Stock or, or Muller and Bergslund, uh, are simply going to have a better chance because of their experience uh, in occupied Europe. Everybody else uh, is really only there to cause trouble. Uh, 
I, I can't imagine that any of them, and I've talked to a lot of ones who are, who are lower down the exit order. None of them imagined they were ever going to get away. No one expected that, that they were going to get home because they, they, most of them didn't speak German. Uh, most of them were wearing their, their battle dress that had been sort of vaguely recut. Uh, they didn't have forged papers. They were just wandering around. Um, so there was no jealousy about the fact that their treatment was, was, uh, different from the favored ones. If you like, everyone knew that, that the people at the, at the top were going to be, have the best chance, but the, although the, the ex organization wasn't, I don't think they were fully informed of, of the German response or what the, what the response was likely to be at the time. It was simply getting the people out of the camp. That was the, the goal. Uh, what happened in the days after didn't matter because once once the alarm was raised and you had had either 250 or 76 guys heading away from the camp, that's how the damage was done. Uh, if if 60 of those 70 people actually get back to England safely, that doesn't that's nice. It doesn't have a huge impact on the war. Uh, it's that first. Uh, the number who get free, that's, that's where the impact on the, on the war is. And that's why, I mean, we may want to get to this later. That's why I think this was a hugely successful operation. Um, uh, a tragedy, yes, but I think it set out to do exactly what Bushel wanted it to do, which was cause disruption. And I think it caused more disruption than he could ever have imagined uh, possible. And that's, that's fascinating because Guy Walters has just had to leave. Ted Barris is still with us. Guy has just had to leave because I think if he was on with you in a panel, he would he would be shaking his head and, and disagreeing. And, that, and that's absolutely fine. As we said at the top of the show, yeah. history is interpretations. Everyone's looking at it from different angles. And the thing is, we cannot now see these events without knowing that 50 men yeah. were murdered by the Gestapo. And yeah. at the time before the escape, that would have seemed very, very unlikely. I mean, I yeah. So I mean, I've, I've talked to yeah. people who said, well, Bushel should have known that the Germans were going to take a harsher line. They, sh he sh they should have known that this was likely to provoke a, I, I, I don't see that myself. This is, this is hindsight. Uh, maybe Bushel personally might've thought that I was going to get a few weeks extra in solitary or, or be shipped off to cold. It's no one. I don't think saw this coming. Um, mm. And, and it was simply the end game was the reaction that they'd always had, you know, the Germans would get very angry and stamp their feet and put them into the cooler for two weeks and, and then life would go on. Uh, no one expected there to be anything different because they didn't have access to the documents that, that we can look at now and see that the response building in the, in the weeks and months before this. Well, this has come up before in other World War II TV shows because it, some of this goes back to the 1942 commando raids and mm -hmm. the Channel Islands and the infamous commando order. There's this, bubbling of an idea within the third reich that 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 they want to do something about these whatever you want to call it not behind the lines but non unconventional ways of finding allied servicemen you know and doing something about it so that mm -hmm. the writing is on the wall in at some point anyway but that you know again we're going back to the events of, of, of the, as the as the, they're coming out of the winter in 1944 yeah. and they would have been seeing increasing numbers of aircraft flying over because where they are in poland they would have heard allied bombing raids they'd have heard the news coming very from because the luftwaffe had their newspaper they'd have had an idea yeah. the war is turning in the allied favor and we're probably through the worst of the war mm -hmm. um so the Nazis aren't going to do anything stupid at this point. So, I mean, the, yeah. the, the prisoners don't, uh, and arguably the camp staff don't, they, they don't see the bigger picture um, because it's, it's, that's what's acted out at the very highest level. I mean, we know now that from the very beginning of the war with the separation of prisoners into uh, army, Navy and air force camps, uh, this bothered the German security services enormously, the RSHA. Um, and from 1941 onwards, the RSHA was trying to take control of, of, of all the prison camps. They were trying to muscle out the military and, and take it over for themselves. So it would, it would then be under Heinrich Himmler. Um, and it was using all these things like the commando order and the commissar order and, and orders against, uh, um, what the Nazis called terror fleekers. Yeah. Using all these as excuses. Oh, the military can't, can't handle these prisoners. They, they're not. Uh, uh, 
they're just not up to the task. Uh, we're we in the police services. We're responsible for capturing when they when they escape. Just turn them all over us to us now, uh, and that's the dynamic that's ongoing when the escape occurs. Uh, and that's why, in my view, the the uh, impact of this was profound because it it occurs at this time when there is blue, brewing in the in the German government a split between the security services and, and the military, and this blows it right open. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the most astonishing things I I remember reading is looking at the German documents uh, and and some of the uh, interviews with with leading Nazis after the war. Uh, Hermann Goering, um, head of the Air Force, a guy who's got Lord knows how many crimes on his hands. Uh, his his he's waist deep in in blood. He says after the war, this is the one thing I knew I was going to have to pay for. Uh, the killing of these fifty guys. This is this is what's on my conscience. This is what's going to haunt me. Uh, and I thought that was quite astonishing for someone like Goering, who who kills without compunction, to seem to have some sort of moral qualm about uh, the fact that he's is is in some measure culpable for these fifty deaths. And that I think is symbolic of of the shock that this sent through the the German government. And this is where it comes back to the size of this escape and the yeah. size of everything against it. Because, you know, I've, I've done other shows here on World War II TV about individual R R RAF and Commonwealth pilots being, you know, murdered by the, the, the SS, but it's two here, three there, yeah. one there. Um, the, the, the scale of this, everything is enlarged. Everything becomes um, more important for PR reasons for both sides. And that's, wh and that's why it has this, this, these events have overshadowed so many others because of that scale and that complexity. But, and again, we're, we're looking at it with the benefit of knowing what yeah. happened, you know, so, but let's go back again to the spring. So this mm -hmm. week, 77 years ago, everything is now building. Tom has been discovered. There's a rush, rush, rush to get out. Um, do you think now there was they were they were now cutting a few corners after this incredible preparation over the previous year or so? They, there is a, a a bit of a we're, we're so close now. Mm -hmm. Let's just kind of leap through those last few days. Um, I actually don't think so. I I think the things that we can identify as as problems in the eventual escape were were things beyond their control. Um. And and things that they can't have uh, known were going to be issues. Um, I think they they couldn't be can't be held responsible for. I mean, we know that that by the beginning of March, Harry's trap had started to wobble a bit because the the um, wood had had swelled and shifted. Um, I mean, that's not something that that we can lay at their feet. Nor can we say, well, maybe they should have put everything aside and, and fix the trap. That's not a realistic uh, uh, response, I don't think. I don't, I don't actually see any corners being cut um, because if you look at the, the, the timing, um, at a certain point, you gotta wait till the snow goes anyways, hmm. uh, or at least until you think you can have some reliable, clear weather. So in January, February, there's no real impetus to, to cut corners and, and speed unnecessarily. Uh, and by the time you get to to uh, this week, 77 years ago, um, at that point, the decision's been made. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of, of little unforeseen issues rather than um, poor planning or, or, or uh, taking the wrong decision at, at critical times. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm a, a, a bushel sure. defender there. But I'm just, think, I'm just being devil's advocate, and I'm just yeah. you know, trying to trying to get a, trying to get some content here. And but you know, and, I, and I'm I, I'm with you. I'm I all, all these years later, I still have enormous respect for all these people, and I try and I wear two hats essentially, one mm -hmm. figuratively and literally. You know, there's that bravery of the men involved, and there's you can also, but also it's it's right to be critical. It's right to yeah. or be objective and critical thinking. But I mean, and I, the other I love thing is, so is, is, is sorry, it's, it's going to just the number of people in the camp, and there yeah. must, despite all the security. There must have just been a buzz building of something's happening. And it's that whole, you get it before Operation Overlord in Normandy. Yeah. Eventually, 
you've just got to go because there's so much pent up. Everyone's trying hard yeah. not to be excited, but there's a feeling that this is on, this is happening. And so eventually you just, you just got to go with your gut instinct and go. And and I always find that we'll, we'll come to the escape. And of course, the end up, the, 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 the exit of the tunnel ends mm -hmm. up not being in the trees. And to me, that's, I think it's almost a subtle reminder that became a huge reminder of this, despite how professional they were being inside the camp, they had yeah. their, their tailors. They still are only amateurs doing a professional job. They think they've surveyed the ground, but with what yeah. they're using, with what they have available to them, it's falling short of where they mm -hmm. really wished it would be. It's, you know, when you look at some of the photos the Germans had of the, of the, of the escape costumes and the replica German ones next to the real ones, you realize they were, Everything was kind of operating at 90%. Now, 90% yeah. in that environment is insanely brilliant. Mm -hmm. But 90% in engineering, for example, you know, you can have a problem. And, that, you know, when you're saying that the, you know, the, the, the shaft way is, is buckling and they're having a problem with wood and the, the, the falls, this is where their complete lack of – or their – they're running out of resources is really affecting them and their lack of, of being a hundred percent professional about something. They think I mean, they are, but they're only reaching a certain target. Yeah. Everything, everything is kind of Heath Robinson ish. Um, everything is bodged together out of other things and, and usually things that it's not designed for. So um, best possible worlds, they can only achieve so much. So I remember I talked to the American fellow who was, who was the, one of the surveyors with Tony Hader. Um, and, and he was the, the one who, uh, he was a fellow from Texas, a uh, wonderful guy. Uh, he and Tony did a lot of the original surveying for the tunnels and, and they knew that because of the equipment they were using and the fact that they couldn't get outside the camp to hold a proper surveyor's rod to, to take a transit that they had to use a tree, they knew exactly what the margin of error was. Uh, and, and, but there was nothing else they could do. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you work with what you've got. And um, so fine, they get to, to March 1944. They, they're at the bottom of the tunnel. Maybe it's too short. Maybe it's not. How do you, how do you tell? Do you stick your hand up and wave? Um, I mean, at a certain point, you have to just, and maybe this is going to sound perverse or something, at a certain point, you have to cross your fingers and, and go for it. Uh, and I think probably in, in the third week of March 1944, that's where X organization was. We've done everything that we possibly can. We're at the point where, where every day is, is costing us in terms of, of making us more vulnerable. Uh, we just have to, have to bite the bullet and, and uh, leap and hope for the best. Mm. And and their flyers, yeah. And I don't want to kind of say that all flyers are the tip of the top, but they, they know the margins of of error and luck. They know how um, fine those chances are, and they've they are all lucky in the sense they've all survived, or most of them have survived some kind of air crash. I mean, not sure exclusively. So they they kind of have that feeling of they have already beaten the odds. So you get to a certain point, you know. You kind of go with that. Well, you know, let's just let's just, as you say, let's just do it. We've got we've, yeah. we've got to be we've confident come this we've far. Got... Let's do it. I mean, it's hard to find something that they should have done or could have done that they didn't do, uh, either through ignorance or or inability. Um, every conceivable base that they could uh, allow for, I I think they did. Uh, and yeah, it's it's this is is a. I mean, Bushel sees this as a military operation. In any military operation. You can never expect things to be 100% your way. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always some gray area. And I think we have to accept that that uh, it was informed his decision making. Uh, okay, we got 90% we got of what we need. 90% um, is pretty good for any operation. Let's go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think that's okay, isn't it? And again, we're we're I've said it before. We we don't we know now what happened in the aftermath, and they mm -hmm. weren't aware of that. And this idea they had of snarling up the german war machine and causing panic and and, and causing all these in, infrastructures and organizations to be spending an ordinary amount of time chasing them and, and doing it was was with merit it was a, as you say it was yeah. a it was a war effort and that's that's the thing it, it it does sometimes come across, and I know Colin Taylor, a friend of mine, is watching. We have this conversation because we're both working mm -hmm. class. I'm a working class from Essex, and he's a working class, class Geordie. Of the cold it's idea of it kind of being upper class toffs trying to get one over matron. There is a little bit of that 
in it. But at the same time, there is this idea, as you said there yourself, that it, 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 they are military prisoners. There is an organization, a hierarchy, there's a rank mm -hmm. structure, and this is, that, this is a, in a sense, is a combat operation. Yeah. I mean, this. so we talked earlier about the guilt of being a prisoner. Um, and there were people in this camp, in the organization, who were shot down on their first mission. So you have, you have a year and a half of, of flying training. Uh, you get in the aircraft for, for Operation Number 1, and boom, you're a POW. Um, these people have a keen appreciation of the fact that they they feel a duty to, but they also want to continue the fight. They also want to continue the war. That's that's um, the, the burden of guilt of a prisoner is that you're not contributing anymore. They, they want to contribute. So I, I would be hard pressed to say that they're not willing to take the risk uh, or, or any risk uh, given what the alternatives were in order to make this a, a successful military, oper military operation. They don't see it as a lark. They don't see it as, as, uh, we'll we'll kind of pile out of the tunnel, have a giggle, and run through the woods. Um, yes, a lot of them see that their chances are very low, but they they see this as they're contributing to the war effort. Uh, and in that regard, given what we know the aftermath, I I find it difficult to gainsay them. Yeah. And it's no different to all the volunteer special forces units we had in World War II. The you know the commandos and the, the they all know the odds. They are they're all volunteers because as we established at the beginning of the show, you could be in that camp and not get involved. You mm -hmm. could be you could completely be against escaping and just be allowed to live your life. Or you could you could participate in some kind of way that was, you know, I'll give my bedboards over, I'll give some of my rations, I'll give my boot heels so you can make use rubber, but I'm not going to be part of anything beyond that. You know, mm -hmm. if you had the ability to 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 serve with whatever level of um um what's the word um, participation that you, yeah. you selected, and no um, one's going to be forced into this organization if they don't want to. Uh, that's uh, Bushel makes that very clear. I mean, it's interesting. So, um, a few years ago, I did a book on on uh, a part of Special Operations Executive, uh, a couple of Canadian spies who were parachuted into France, and. Uh, F section of Special Operations Executive sent about 400 English trained agents into occupied France. A um, little over 100 of them were, were captured and ex executed, which for a lot of historians is, is a frightful loss, uh, a catastrophic loss rate for all these agents. But in fact, the, the Royal Air Force squadrons that flew these people to France had a higher loss rate than the agents themselves. And no one ever uh, wrings their hands about uh, 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 casualties out of RAF Thamesford. So, um, and I mean, this is this is the point I make at the at, at the end of of my book, A Gallant Company. If if the fifty people, this is what seven Lancaster crews, uh, put it into the terms of any operation that bomber cabin is is flying on any given night, uh, you lose seven seven aircraft in a raid. That's a big success. Um, yeah. So if we if we think about these people as operational uh, airmen, albeit grounded, if you like, uh, then I think it puts the the cost into a slightly different light. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point, and you know that that cost is, is is you have to look at it in context, as you say, of what's going on elsewhere. So yeah, everyone knows the aftermath. You know, seventy six men get out, fifty are are, are well, all bar three. I kept recaptured mm -hmm. and sent to various base, some back to Stalag three, some to other camps and three, three home runs uh, and 50 are murdered. But what often doesn't get talked about, which I'd like to move on before we come to the end of this, mm -hmm. this evening is for the, the remaining thousands of men in the camp. We, we're left again from the movie with the idea, because James Garner is the one who's, you know, was it worth it? And yeah. to, to, to James Donald. And, but what was the feeling within the camp? What was the, where, where, obviously the, the deep loss of their, of their friends, but, mm -hmm. At the time, without the benefit of years of reflection, at that time, they've still got another, not quite a year, but another mm -hmm. 10 months of uh, captivity ahead of them. Do you think they went into that 10 months with an in increased morale or lower morale because of the escape? Um, that's a tough question, Paul. Um, there's no question that this was a shock. Uh, mm -hmm because as we said earlier, they didn't expect this kind of reaction. And there's no question that if, if you want to look at it in terms of, of uh, German policy, this it, it ended escape attempts in Love 3 and in many other parts of the, the camp system. 
Uh, it was recognized by most of the um, prisoners' leaders that escaping was no longer worth the risk anymore. Uh, and so, I mean, in that sense, it's it solved the problem for for the Luftwaffe. Um, I think it demonstrated to the prisoners who might have been um, might have been getting comfortable in captivity with with relatively friendly guards and and fairly decent food and lots to do. And and I think we have to admit that that compared to most people in um, who were imprisoned in, in Nazi Germany and occupied Europe, the, the Air Force uh, prisoners are pretty close to the top of the of the heap in terms of what mm. they uh, the, their standard of living, if you like. I think the escape demonstrates to them that that uh, their captors are um, not really like what they've come to expect, and that they're really at the mercy of. Uh, I mean, these Luftwaffe chappies might be quite decent, but they're they're not in control anymore. Uh, and so it's obvious to the prisoners that, that um, the enemy they're fighting are uh, vicious and ruthless and are, are untroubled by the war- laws of war. And if they ever doubted uh, the nature of the enemy, I think this, this um, disabused them of that notion. Yeah. I mean, I th- my, I mean, my answer, I haven't interviewed the veterans you have, but my answer yeah. is, is that those who were affirmed anti-escapers weren't were going to be that was the the tragic events were going to just reinforce their ideas of why they didn't get involved in the first place. The mm. absolute obsessive escapers who just probably weren't going to change their views either. To me, it's that middle voter. It's that kind of like an election. It's the swing <laughs> yeah. voters. I think it's, it's the, the undecided the who perhaps, as you said there had maybe had the occasional kind of jokey interaction with a Luftwaffe guard and they kind of got a little bit comfortable there. Mm-hmm. We all we all um, build our own cages. Look at COVID over the last... We've all mm-hmm. been prisoners of war to a certain extent because of COVID. And after a while, we kind of fall into our routines to some extent. Okay, not those of us who've lost people, you know, don't let's not be little death over COVID. But, mm-hmm. you know, we get into our routines of imprisonment, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're right. I think those who were perhaps on the fence about it, now absolutely realized what the enemy they were facing were capable of, such Mm -hmm. as you get the same thing when you get the infantry units who discover the death camps and things like that. You know, any sense of why are we here, Fred, Jim, Bob, dissipated when you see Belson or you see Dakar. So I think that it could have hardened those people in the middle that, you know, whether or not you've approved of the escape per se, that might have stayed in one area, but your understanding of who your enemy was mm-hmm. would have become much more, um, you know, real. And my God, these guys are representing something thoroughly awful. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's, it seems to be from the guys I've talked to, they, they seem to recognize that, um, the camp staff, the guards, and and uh, some of the administrative staff are deeply troubled by this, um, and they, I think, they start to understand that what happens at the camps from now on is is out of their control. It's not the guys who who they see every day in the commandantur who are running things. It's it's the police at the next level, and I think that's that's uh, borne out with dreadful clarity in, in January of 45 when the camps evacuated. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, the, the decisions are made by German command to, to evacuate all prisoners and, and uh, move them westwards. And in that evacuation, the, the prisoners and the guards are, are fellow sufferers. Uh, they're, they're both fighting for their lives, trudging along the, the, uh, the roads in the Polish countryside. Um, and so there's a sense by then that they are uh, on the same side against a greater evil, if you like. Mm. Uh, and the greater evil is, is the Nazi command. Uh, it's a curious kind of um, uh, dynamic uh, that emerges after the, in, the, in the weeks and months after the news of the killings get back. Get back. Yeah, and it's the, it's the aspect that we don't talk about as much because it, after the the breakout, it all becomes about the, uh, the the escapers, and then of course you get mm-hmm. the aftermath of the post war. The as as guys going to come on and talk about the end of the week of the hunt for the mur- murderers, which actually was one of the most successful. I've done other shows about small yeah. groups of murders and never had anything like the resources 
sure. that were, were given to the Great Escape search because it was again, it's all about the size, isn't it? It was, it was the if you were going to go after one, that's the that's the lot to go after. Yeah, and, and the I mean, and of the Gestapo. Sorry to interrupt. This percentage of the Gestapo guys who were captured and arrested and tried was really high on the Great Escape murders mm -hmm. compared to other Allied uh, Commonwealth pilots and what have you. And and that's the groundwork's really laid as soon as the the murders become public. And um, I mean, Anthony Eden announcing that that they will, the British government will do all it can to track down those those responsible. So he makes that commitment in in May forty four that we're not going to let this lie, that, that we're going to act on this after the war. Um, and I think it, um, it becomes kind of a test case, if you like. Uh, mm. So are, are, are we really going to do what, what uh, Anton Eden said, or are we going to just sort of deal with this as we're dealing with other crimes? And it, it's evident that this is, um, the British government takes this as seriously as it said it would in 1944 and, and follows up to, I think you're right. It's it's uh, the the police operation, as you'll you'll hear in later on in the week. Uh, remarkable uh, operation goes on. What 1968? I think is the last Luft yeah. three trial. And I guess so, it, became, it it gets to the point where it was such a large operation to murder those fifty. It left a bigger paper trail than than just murdering one person side of the road. There was that, there was that much more organization behind it. It was therefore theoretically easier to to under, un, uh, discover and and break and and bring people to justice. But um I mean it's that the the Nazis were at that point paid for being such a heavily bureaucratized organization. Yeah. Uh, everything had its paper trail and if you could if you could find it that's the, if you could find the paper trail you could you could go a long way. And so <laughs> it's always curious when the for example, when the Germans evacuate Paris in the summer of 1944, um, arguably the most important thing they decide they have to do is burn papers uh, mm. to, yeah, to yeah. cover their paper trail. So that's the that's the, the cost of being bureaucratized. Well, yeah, I mean, this hour has absolutely flown by. And the question I'm going to ask everybody at the end of each interview over the course of this week is, and it's maybe a difficult one to answer in a, in a nutshell, but... You know what? What is the Great Escape legacy to you today? You know, for someone who's been studying it for four decades or something, wh where is its place in po in in popular memory? What is the legacy of of Roger and all those men and what they achieved? Um, oh, <laughs> do I have to pick just one? <laughs> well, sure, you can do two or three. I mean, I think so. So very quickly, I mean, I I've, I've been a couple of years ago, a a guy teaching in a business school and uh, somewhere in I forget where came to me and said he wanted to write a book on uh, a business textbook on project management using the great escape as as the case and and so he did and so it, it's a a fascinating example of how bushel was able to uh, manage this large group of people uh, to achieve remarkable things in incredibly difficult um, uh, situations so I think that's that's one aspect it it the lesson is how much "Quote unquote," normal people can achieve in abnormal circumstances. Uh, I think that's really uh, important. The other thing, um, the reason why I first got took up this study is because I saw the film, then I read Paul Brickell's book, and uh, I was struck by how many of the the characters in that book were just names. You, you read the name once or twice, and there's there's no real person behind it, and so I. We talked about different approaches. My approach was to to write a kind of personal account, individual account of of the escapers, because I wanted to show that that these were not kind of supermen or or giants or um, anything like that. These were just normal guys uh, who who found they had certain skills, and in uh, an extraordinary situation, acted upon them. Uh, and so I wanted to give them. Uh, their lives back, I guess their their identities back, and and show the show the reading public uh, who was behind the name that they might have been uh, familiar with before. It's also just a great story, Paul. I mean, it's, it's uh, mm. uh, <laughs> and I think that's what um, marks its longevity. Uh, it's a terrific story, and I, it's hardly surprising that that generation after generation gets drawn into it. And I think if if seeing The Great Escape or, or reading one of the early books uh, can draw people into looking at other aspects of, of this history, the Second World War, or, or whatever history, uh, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty important 
uh, impact of it. It, it. it started me on the career that I, I, uh, I'm lucky enough to have now. Uh, I can credit becoming a, a historian to that, that night back in uh, May 1971 or something uh, when I refused to go to the fireworks because I was transfixed by this film. Uh, and if it has impact like that on people, I think that's, that's terrific. Yeah, and I, I I completely agree, and I think it, as a kid, I always when I, when I was reading my com- my comics things like that as a kid, I could never identify as being a commando or a you know a paratrooper, but I could identify with working on something in a in a in a camp. And I in fact I was in graphic design, so I always mm-hmm. kind of think I'd have ended up in the forgery department just because that's what I was good at, you know. And and I think it, the the reason it endures, one of the reasons it endures, is that there are these levels of nuance that you can talk about it. What would I do if I was in a camp? Would I try and escape? Would I not try and escape? Um, that that it, we we can discuss the the merits of it. What what were they thinking? The, is the plan to try and snarl up the German or, uh, war machine a good one or a bad one? These mm-hmm. these are these questions that there is no definitive answer. To that there's every historian has their view. Mm-hmm. Everybody watching this had this had their view, and therefore, it, like what went wrong in Operation Market Garden, there is no single. That's it. Yeah. You know, th- there's a solution. The fact we don't have an agreed reason is what makes it keep going it means there's still room for new historians like guy came at it fairly recently and put a new angle at it i'm sure someone else will write a book in a few years time and put a different spin on it from a different point of view and that's important that's that's because history is 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 ever ever changing and the viewpoint of it is always moving i mean that's what that's what it's all about i when, when my students come to me in first year university uh and and they ask me what's the answer or or, or what's the truth in this subject, I say, look, this is history. There are there are all sorts of different truths. Uh, there are all sorts of different answers. I I've got one explanation in my lecture. You look at it, you may have another one. Uh, Ted Barris may have one one way of looking at this guy is another way. Uh, I mean, together we're we're all trying to get to the same point. That is to understand this historical event more more clearly and completely. Um, but you can do that in in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and any different perspective that that takes us closer to understanding what went on and how and why, uh, I mean, that's what we're all here for, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I was funny. I was reading um, reviews of your book on Amazon today, <laughs> and people were using the same thing to either praise you or beat you with it. And it was the <laughs> amount of people you talk about. Oh, there yeah. There were multiple yeah. reviews saying, I loved how he talked about all these different people. It was great to get the back, as you said there, to give, to give, personalities all these people this guy was shot down flying a wellington in 1941 he became this and another reviewer said there were too many people i couldn't yeah. i couldn't keep it and it's you know that those people maybe would be better suited with the movie where as we know it is just the 10 people you've only got to remember those and exactly. very distinctive composites. so it's interesting that even with with the reviews the thing that one person likes is the very thing someone exactly. else doesn't like that is exactly. opinion that is exactly how it is and 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 with the great escape, everyone will always have an opinion about it, and everyone will always, um, you know, um, think well they should have never have had the Steve McQueen in the motorbike. And to me, I can't not have that in the film. It's still it's, a, it's part even of it. though it's stupid. If you yeah. took that out, it wouldn't have the finale, you know. And every time I watch it, I hope he's going to make it over the fence, and I know he won't. It was. <laughs> Just I mean, hope I'm he will. All- I always get asked, is there anything new in history? And the, the great thing is that there's always things new in history and, and there are new interpretations, but there is also always um, the potential for new stuff to come out. Uh, and I fully expect that that um, before I, I slip this mortal coil, um, some new documents will emerge from the Great Escape. Someone's logbook will turn up or letters or diaries or something from the camp that, that has, has been hidden for 100 years. And this will give us a new perspective on on this event. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's lots of new stuff in history. We're we're coming upon it every day, and that's why it's it's so much fun because uh, we can all be proven right. We can all be proven wrong at any given time. <laughs> and that's why you know, of course, this week we'll we'll go back and forth with these conversations, and people will will disagree with some of the things you say, agree with some of the things you say, agree with me, disagree with me, and that's the whole point. It's uh, we don't have to come to a complete conclusion at the end of the week. Yeah. We can just talk about it, and and in doing so. We are paying tribute to all these people and the resourcefulness they show, the dedication they showed, and we can pay tribute to the fact the fifty of them and others in the various but paid paid the ultimate price for this 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 um this resourcefulness. So anyway, 
Um, yeah. I've really enjoyed talking to you, Jonathan, and um, I would love to have you back on again. It's something to talk about something else in a bit. I like the idea of doing an SOE show with you at some point if you're if you're welcome to come and join that. But sure, anytime. To My save pleasure. some of the things to talk about during the course. So to remind people what we've got coming up, so we've got two shows tomorrow. So Ted Barris is coming on, talking particularly about some of the Canadians he's written about. And then later on, we have some family members, including uh, Wally Fl Floody's son, Brian, is going to be joining us to talk about his who Jonathan mentioned earlier. Then we've got Louise Williams talking about John Williams. And we've got um, talking about Jens Muller, the, the, the Norwegian got back, and we're going to finish with Guy Walters. And then finally, on the very last show, it's going to be a discussion about the film. And we can talk about the motorbike and all that and go there. So over the course of seven shows, we're going to come at it from every single angle. So it remains for me to say thank you, everybody, for watching. Don't forget to check the various different times of the shows this week. Because the one with Louise Williams, she's calling from Australia, so it's in the afternoon. And so just keep an eye on YouTube for the various times we'll be hosting them. But other than that, thank you very much, Jonathan, for joining us. I'll let you go back to... You finished teaching for the day now, haven't you? Yeah, you finished. Every day, I got, a, I got a mark papers for tomorrow. So, oh, tragic. so <laughs> thanks for joining us. And, and everybody <laughs> else, pleasure. I will see you all tomorrow on World War II TV. This is Paul Woodage. That was the first episode of our Great Escape Week. I will see you all again tomorrow. Thanks for watching, everybody.